Good. Uh, I said last week that one of the things I wanted to do in this series uh, between now and Lent really was to look at some of the convictions that I've come to about what God is saying to me, uh, to us as a church, uh, but even in fact what I think God might be saying to us as a nation. And so to get us started, if you'd like to turn to Hebrews, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4, and I'll read to us. I'll give you a few moments whether you've got a paper copy like me or whether you're looking it up on a device. Hebrews chapter 4. And you'll know we went through Hebrews in our midweek Bible study last year. And the key to Hebrews really is it's it's the supremacy of Jesus in all things. The supremacy of Jesus in all things. In particular, how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the hopes and all the promises of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And, and therefore, what he offers is supreme over anything else. Because why would you, why would you pursue the shadows when the light has come? Why would you go back to waiting when the promised one has arrived? That's, that's the essence of, of Hebrews. And so all the hopes, all the promises of God to his people are fulfilled in Jesus. And we're going to look at one of them now from verse 14, thinking about how Jesus fulfills all the promises about, uh, about the priesthood and how all the great priests in the Old Testament were actually just a picture of Jesus to come. So this is what it says from verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we once more gather together around your word, looking for comfort, looking for strength, looking for hope, looking for a word that will sustain us in the week ahead and grant us grace to draw closer to you. And so, Father, as we ponder your word, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would know you speaking to us in our hearts, in our consciences. Whether we need a word of encouragement or correction, guidance or hope. But we ask more than this. We ask that through this time, we would see the Lord Jesus more clearly and be drawn closer to him. Father, in his name we ask him. Amen. Well, most of us are having to spend a bit more time than normal in our homes at the moment, for reasons that I don't need to remind you of. So let me ask you, how is your house? Uh, actually, having to spend a bit more time there. Have you noticed the, the odd thing that needs to be doing uh, maybe a bit of DIY, or maybe when we have to get a builder in to do that, or when this is done, we need to get a decorator in to sort that. Or maybe you've gone a bit further and thought, you know what, I've just, just had enough of this house in the nicest possible way. It's time we moved somewhere else. So let me ask you this question. If you could live anywhere, where would you live? Now, and don't all jump up and say Herm Bay, of course. I mean, no, if you could dream, if you could go anywhere, where, where, where would you live? I mean, would it be in this country or you, you ever had the dream of, of maybe living overseas? Or if it is in this country, is it a, a, a different county, a, a different part of the country altogether? Would you rather not be so near the sea? Would you rather be up in the hills or down in a valley somewhere? 
my wife has suggested the Outer Hebrides. Uh, that's not because she wants to live there. That's just where she thinks I ought to go when I'm snoring. It could be far enough away. But joking aside, if, if you could live anywhere, where would you live? I want to suggest to you in the, in the strongest possible terms that one of the things that God is, is saying to his church, not just to me, not just to you, but to his church through this pandemic is that there is a place where we can all learn to live that we have neglected because of the distractions, because of the busyness of this world. And now because all of that has been shaken, God is turning our eyes back to our true home where he calls us to dwell. Because what this passage is all about is learning to dwell with Christ at the throne of God. To dwell with Christ at the throne of God. And the great thing about that is that wherever we might be living geographically, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and through the precious work of Jesus, to dwell with Christ at the throne of God, is something we can all do every day, wherever we are. The key verse I want to, to focus on is verse 16. Let us then with confidence, some translations have it as boldness, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And what I want to do is to break down that verse into each of its little component uh, phrases or clauses. And as, and as I've often said to you, our English translations, although they are very good and very accurate, they are translations from another language, in this case from New Testament Greek or Koinonia Greek as it's known. And in translating from one language to another, sometimes words and phrases don't go exactly. There's not a hundred percent. Uh, correlation between them and particularly in this verse there are a number of things that a knowledge of, of the Greek words uh, it brings a richness to the verse it helps us if you like to move from a black and white understanding to a multicolored understanding of the verse and what it means so let's work our way through it and receive some of the the encouragement and blessing that God has for us in this verse the first is that little, uh, that little word, or two words in English, with confidence. Let us then, with confidence. Uh, the Greek word there comes from a root word that literally means to pour out. To pour out. So I've got my communion cup here, ready for communion in, in, in a minute. Now, if this was full to the brim of wine and I was just to tip it so that it all came out, in Greek, you would use that word or a, a variant of that word that is translated as confidence. And I think, what a wonderful picture. What a wonderful picture, because what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, it's not just confidence of attitude. The, the, the picture there is being able to pour out to God whatever is in our hearts. And surely at a time like this, that is a... That is a precious encouragement that whatever we're feeling, whether we're in a great place or whether we're in a difficult place, whether we're full of hope or whether we're full of anxiety or despair or worry, whatever it is that the root picture there of coming to God with confidence is that we can pour out whatever is in our hearts. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, when my my wife suffers with ME, she's often in a lot of pain. She often says to me, "I'm sorry to keep going on about how, how much pain I'm in." And I always say, "Sweetheart, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You never have to say sorry for that. I understand." Well, God is like that, only a thousandfold. We never have to apologize to God for what's in our hearts, 
I mean, yes, there may be some, some sinful things there that we need to confess and receive forgiveness for, but we never have to apologize for pouring it out to him. We never have to have that attitude of, oh, I know you must be fed up, God, of hearing this. You must, you must be so busy with everybody else's problems. And my, my problems are so small. You know what we're like, those attitudes. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, whatever, whatever is in there, pour it out. Pour it out to God. He is more than happy. He wants to hear what is in your heart. And that's not me saying that. That is not some kind of nice, woolly, fluffy promise from a preacher. That is there in the word of God. Let us then, with confidence, let us then pour out, pour out whatever is in our hearts. So what's in your heart today? What are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with? Is your heart full of joy and thanksgiving? Or is it actually a heart that's laid down with a lot of burden and worry? You can come to God and pour out, pour out to him whatever is in you, however you're feeling, whatever you're struggling with. Let us then with confidence. So when you see that word confidence or the word boldness, as some translations have it, have that picture in your mind where that Greek word comes from. See the cup full of whatever's inside it being poured out. And know that's what God wants you to do as you approach him. Second key phrase there is it says, let us then with boldness, with confidence, draw near. Draw near. I was sharing with the, the Bible study uh, on Wednesday. I was sharing some verses for the year. One of the things I do is uh, uh, each new year, as, so last year was 2020, I looked at some of the chapter 20, verse 20s in the Bible to see what they said. And this year I've done the same with some of the great chapter 20s, verse 21s to see, see what they say, some verses for the year. Um, and the first one I started was, with, was Exodus 20, 21. And it basically says, the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to God in the darkness. And I just, without over-spiritualizing that text, just made two simple points. The, the first one is this, that often within the church, there seem to be two types of people. One is content just to stand back to be on the edges, to enjoy church and all its activities. And, and, and that's enough. And that's all that they want. But the other one, the other type of people are the people like Moses, for whom that is not enough. And they want to press in. They want to press in and get closer to God. Because as much as they enjoy church, it's God that it's all about. It's Jesus that it's all about. And so which type of person are you going to be? One that just sort of stands back at a distance? Or one that chooses to press in and draw near to God? The second point I made from that text, which might be particularly appropriate for the moment, is, is where did Moses find God? He found him by pressing through the darkness. I think that's a word for our moment. That for many of us who are struggling with what appears to be a great darkness, it is as we press in towards God that we will actually find him in the midst of that darkness. And the, the great promise here in Hebrews is that because of the blood of Jesus, we can draw near to God. If you like, the, uh, the doors of the throne room are open. The carpet has been laid out and God beckons us to draw near. It's not like we're having to press in against a strong headwind that's trying to blow us back. It's quite the reverse. As we press in, we find God drawing us, welcoming, welcoming us to come closer to him and his throne. This year, Will you be somebody who stands back or will you be somebody who presses in through the darkness 
to draw nearer to God. And then the third little phrase we find is that it's a throne of grace. A throne of grace. You see, in the Old Testament, God's throne was associated with his glory, with his holiness, and with his power. In other words, God's throne was a fearful place, and, and quite rightly so. It was a place where flesh and blood was not fit to tread. It was a place where you might come with fear and trembling in expectation of judgment because you were coming to the most holy place and the most holy God. And who knows what kind of welcome you might receive given the righteousness of God and the sinfulness of our own hearts. But now that Old Testament picture, which was one of, yes, of majesty, but also one of fearfulness, has been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this same throne, which is just as glorious, just as majestic, just as holy, but it's now a throne of grace. And here I think we have the, the beauty of the Christian faith and of the Christian understanding of God. We worship almighty God, all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, glory beyond comprehension, a God who is a blazing fire of purity and holiness, who is the creator of all things, who, who is knowable but yet beyond knowing, transcendent above us in every possible respect. And yet because of Jesus, not only can we come to his throne, but when we do, we find it is not a throne of condemnation but it is a throne of grace. It is not a throne that will push us down and judge us for our sins. It is a throne that will lift us up and give us mercy and strength. So remember, as you draw near to God, and I hope when you do draw near to God in prayer, you, you often take that moment just to reflect on how glorious God is. I hope you take a moment to reflect on the fact, fact what an awesome privilege it is to be able to come to his throne. Because that's what we're being invited to do, to come into the very presence of God. Not at a distance, but to come to his throne. Also take a moment to reflect that as you do so, gloriously, wondrously, this is a throne of grace. And uh, if you remember one of the, the best definitions of grace, grace is unmerited, undeserved favor, blessing, and help given through Jesus Christ to those who don't deserve it. That's the throne we come to. And then the next phrase is we're told that we can come at and receive mercy receive mercy and here's the thing i want to point out here that receive is is actually not the best translation because the word that is translated receive is one of those words that won't quite go into english but i'll give you the sense of what it means it means you know if i was to hold out this this cup and just hold it there and you were to come along and grab it with your hand what you've just done is, is that Greek word that's translated receive, but it's an active thing. It's taking hold of with the hand. It's in elsewhere. It's, it's, it's uh, translated uh, to claim, to take what is rightfully mine, to take something in order to take it away with me, not in a violent sense, not wrestling it away, but taking it away because it's rightfully mine. And this is the point I want to, want you to get hold of from, from the passage here that when you come to God's throne you have a, di a divinely given right to take hold of mercy 
It is yours, bought with the blood of Jesus. We're going to celebrate that in just a few minutes when we take communion together. We're going to remember his body on the cross and his blood shed in crucifixion. The righteous for the unrighteous, the holy for the unholy, to pay our debt and to bestow on us all the blessings of his righteousness, a double exchange. He takes my sin and its judgment and I receive his righteousness before God and all its blessings. And because of that, just as you will take hold of a little cup in a couple of minutes to drink of the wine and remember, God says you can come to my throne and it's yours to claim, to take hold of mercy. So the times when you think you least deserve it, the times when you feel most condemned by your sins or your failures or your inadequacies or your struggles or the voice in your head that says you ought to be doing better. You can come home to hold to come to God's throne and as a divinely given right, you can take hold of his mercy and know it's yours and take it away with you. Two little phrases left to go. I hope you're finding this an encouragement. Here's the fifth one. To find grace to help. So we come, we come with boldness, with confidence to pour out whatever's in our hearts. We can draw near, come into his presence, coming to God on a throne of grace that we can take hold of his mercy and then to find grace to help. Now, did you remember my instruction from last week to find yourself a bit of string uh, or, or a bit of wool? If so, here's a bit here. I'd like you uh, to take hold of it now and, and just to, to feel it in your fingers because this, I want you to take this with you this week, uh, either to place it in your Bible or maybe uh, put it somewhere where you'll see it on a desk on your mirror, tie it on your steering wheel on your car, if you're going to be in your car a lot, wherever you might be, just, just to take it with you this week. And here's why. That word that's translated help, grace to help, is uh, it's just a beautiful word. Uh, it it's only, it only occurs one other place in the entire Bible. It's a nautical word. And the other time you find it is in Acts 27, when Paul is caught in that horrendous storm uh, we well, you know they, they end up getting shipwrecked. Um, and what we're told is that because they were scared that the ship was about to fall apart, they passed ropes under the ship and, and tied the ropes. And that's the only other place that that, that that word that's translated help occurs because, as I said, it's a nautical word. word and, and in the ancient world, that's exactly what they would do when a ship was in trouble. When a ship was in danger, there were wooden hold ships, wooden hulls. Um, when the ship was in trouble and they felt it, it might break apart, they would take ropes and wrap the rope around the hull of the ship, pass it underneath and wrap it around the hull of the ship and tie it so that the rope would stop the boat from falling apart. And to do that, is the word that's translated help. In other words, when you feel that you're at the end of your rope, remember God is putting a rope of grace around your life to hold it together. So take your bit of rope with you wherever you go this week and remember I might be at the end of my rope, but God is wrapping a rope of grace around me. That's what that word help means. It means by means of wrapping a rope around my life, I might feel I'm falling apart, but God is wrapping his grace around me to hold me together. The final thought is that we might come in our time of need. 
And uh, the Greek word of interest there uh, is a word that uh, comes from the, you know, there's two types of time in Greek. There's chronos, we get chronometer from that. Chronos is um, tick-tock time, tick, 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 hours, minutes, seconds, it's just time. But the other word for time is, is a word that we might translate as season or appropriate time. In other words, it's not just TikTok time. It means it's, it's a special time. It's the, it's the season for something. And that's the, a variant of that word is used there. Kairos is, is the Greek word, kairos time. That's the, the word that's used there in, in that passage. Now, what does it mean? Well, the way it's translated here is, you know, that we might come and find uh, time, uh, find help in our time of need. But actually, that's not the only way it can be translated. And I, and I did check this out. I actually emailed uh, a Greek scholar and asked him about this. And he, can, he said to me, no, you're absolutely right. It, it can be translated this other way. It, in other words, it, it, it doesn't necessarily point to us and our time of need. It might actually, and given the context, it's pointing the other way to God. And what it means is, we might feel that we're in trouble. We might feel that we're struggling. We might feel that this is not a good time. But whenever we come to God, he views it as the right time. It's a bit like where elsewhere in Hebrews, the writer says, now is the day of God's favor. Now is the day of our salvation. In other words, whatever time you're going through, whether it's a good time or a difficult time, whether it's a great time or a struggling time, whether it's a time full of blessings or a time of anxiety or difficulty, in that sense, it doesn't matter. Whenever you come to God, he says, now's the right time. Now's the right time. Now is the time of my favor. Now is the time of my blessing. Now is the time of my help. And what, what, why, why, why is that? Why is it, if you like, why is God open 24-7 in grace? It's because of Jesus. It's because of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has so transformed everything that now whenever we come before God in the name of Jesus, our Father says to us, this is a good time. This is a good time for us to speak. This is a good time for you to share that with me because this is the good time for me to help you. I started by asking you where you wanted to live. Some people I know have uh, what they call mood boards or picture boards or vision boards where they put up pictures of the, of the house they'd like to live in or the car they'd like to own, or, or even the place they like, they would like to live. Do you have something like that? Do you have maybe a picture from a magazine that you've cut out that you keep somewhere and you go, one day I'd like to live there? Well, let me tell you, I, I do have something like that. Up on the ceiling of the bedroom, I have a little postcard. And it simply says the words, so I see it every night before I go to sleep. It simply says the words, to be with Christ at the throne of God. By the grace of the Lord Jesus, that is where we can all learn to dwell. That's where I want to live. Where do you want to live? Let's pray. And as we do so, let's just maybe hang on to that little bit of string. Maybe you want to wrap it around your hand, just as a little reminder. And let's, let's claim that promise as we pray together now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the wonders, the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for all that he's done for us. And Father, particularly as we take hold of this wonderful verse in Hebrews, we thank you that we can draw near to you. And not only so, but when we do, we find mercy. 
we find grace to help. We find that rope of divine help being wrapped around us in grace to hold us together when we don't know how to hold ourselves together. Father, we pray that that will be the testimony of each and every one of us through this time. That I knew the rope of divine grace around my heart, around my mind, around my life. I knew that when I could not hold myself, my loving God was holding me. And we pray, Father, that each one of us during this time will learn a lesson that will stand us instead for the rest of our lives that we will learn to draw near. We will learn to dwell with Christ at your throne, O Father. In his name we ask him. Amen.